everyone. My name is Borislav Gerasimov. I'm the um, uh, coordinator for communications and advocacy at the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women. And um, this is another installment of our series together with Sharmila Parmanant, a PhD student in, uh, in Gender Studies at the University of Cambridge, uh, where we are holding a series of conversations with people to evaluate uh, the implementation of the protocol on human trafficking, the UN protocol on human trafficking, sometimes referred to as the Palermo protocol. Uh, now that uh, this year um, is the 20th anniversary since its adoption. So today we are joined by uh, Simanti Dasgupta, Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Dayton, Ohio. Hi Simanti, and thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us. Um, so, can you first tell us more about yourself um, and the communities you work with? Uh, thank you, Bobby, and thank you, Sharmila, for this invitation. This is quite exciting, especially the year we are observing the 20th year of the Palermo Protocol. Um, so give, to give you a background of my work with Durban Mohila Shamanoi Committee, I began this work in 2000. 11. So DMSC is, uh, it's Durba Rumohila Shamanai Committee. And the word Durba in Bengali means um, unstoppable. It's almost, let's think about it as, as though it were a storm. So it's unstoppable. So it's actually quite a powerful name. Yeah. So DMSC comes into existence. It's founded in 1995. And just to give you a background of how this actually the organization comes uh, comes to be is it's a uh, it actually kind of starts coinciding with the HIV AIDS epidemic. So looking at the late uh, 1980s and early 1990s, which is kind of the height of the AIDS epidemic in India, and in 1992. Uh, the All India Institute of Hygiene and Medical Hygiene and Health in Calcutta actually launched what is now known as the Shonagachi Project to do a baseline survey of the rate of infection in Shonagachi. And they recruited peer educators who are the sex workers themselves to actually work with the other sex workers to promote the condom as a prophylactic device. The peer educators realized that without the basis of a legal standing, that they would not really have a way to collectivize about labor rights. And this is where we kind of see the emergence of the labor rights uh, discourse. Now, what was remarkable about this, um, the prevention program, the Shonagachi uh, project is that uh, it was a public health project, right? It was public health and how do we stop the epidemic? So sex workers were designated as a, a high risk group. But what the project itself did was on the ground, it actually recalibrated it to also make the argument that HIV AIDS is as much a threat to the sex workers body and livelihood as well. So this is where it becomes in some ways what, a, what we may want to think of as kind of a radical departure. And because of this radical departure and because they could successfully um, reinscribe the project as also a project to pre, uh, preserve and protect the livelihood of sex workers. And this is where the labor rights movement started gaining traction. And as much as I say this in rather <laughs> simple, straightforward ways, but it was not an easy thing to do. It, it was actually an extremely difficult uh, process to even achieve, even within Shonagachi, to actually collectivize the sex workers to this room. It finally happens, as we know, it's one of the uh, one of the most successful sex work movement across the globe, and the Shonagachi project become, has become uh, a model for you know, community empowerment and interventions and all of that. In the anti-trafficking sector, there seems to be almost a romanticization of hard data and numbers, right? This seduction of quantification. Um, how do you, what role do you see ethnographic research playing then in terms of understanding trafficking or in terms of 
designing interventions around it if, if that is what we want to do. Thanks, Sharmila. Yes, I think that's a very important thing, right? Oftentimes the Global Slavery Index, the, the USTIP reports is all about numbers. And I think ethnography does not necessarily have to depart from the numbers. One can look at the numbers, but look at the numbers uh, as in a, in a juxtaposition with um, the qualitative work. Um, one thing is for sure that it is a very difficult task to get actually numbers. So I've tried to get numbers of, for instance, how many raids have happened in Shonagatsi. And this is, I'm talking to the police headquarters, right? And I'm saying like, how many, how many raids do you, like how many raids were there in say in the last four years, five years? It's very hard to get that number, which you would think is a kind of an obvious number, but it doesn't happen. Uh, and the second thing also is, for instance, related to that, how many quote unquote minors were rescued. And I'm using minors and rescued, I don't have to say this to you, but I'm using them in quotes because that's where the interrogation of the ethnographic mo modality comes into play. This is where ethnography uh, adds an enormous value is because to be an ethnographer is an enormously difficult task because you have to build uh, the trust, right? To be able to build the trust, you require time and you require a level of commitment where um, you are seen as a collaborator rather than somebody who comes to extract information or data, if I may say. And I think that kind of trust gives you insights into anti-trafficking on the ground. For instance, oftentimes, and this is not news to both of you, is that oftentimes women who are seen as minors or perceived as minors, and that, that is a whole different um, you know, area we can talk about, like they are just uh, apprehended, taken away, and kind of, I would say, um, disappeared, right? I'm not saying disappeared in this way that we've talked about disappearance as state violence, but in some way it has disappeared, they, they just disappear. And so to have that kind of follow-up, I'm able to accompany um, the MSC members to the local police station, to the police headquarters, to the child and wealth, child and um, child and uh, child welfare committee, which is a nodal agency for rescuing of minors. And what what comes out of these um, uh, sites, and because you are there, is a very granular, granular level of, um, you know, uh, way of thinking about anti-trafficking on the ground. So, for instance, when I am at the Child Welfare Committee with the DMSC members, and we are they are trying to follow up on a specific uh, woman who clearly was not a minor has been apprehended, but how? the state kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of declines to answer the questions uh, from, a, from a place of power because they have the power, but also from the place of a sense of morality. Like, you know, that, you know, these are, this is bad work. So uh, they should not be, and then, you know, rescuing uh, kids and minors is obviously has its own normative um, arguments. So, you know, our series is sort of um, aiming to evaluate or to reflect on the UN trafficking protocol, but I think in India, it's maybe a bit more complicated than the anti-trafficking or the trafficking protocol, because India already had um, its Immoral Traffic Prevention Act, the ITPA, um, and then there is also the TVPA, uh, the American uh, legislation, which sort of rushed um, all the rescuers, I guess, who are impacting on the lives of sex workers in India. So I guess my broader question is, you know, what has been the impact of the anti-trafficking framework on sex workers in India? Do you see any difference between these different types of legislations or uh, in the impact of these different types of legislations? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, from, from your field work, what, um, what have you noticed? Yes, Bobby, thank you. I, I think that that's a really important 
question because, um, and I, I was thinking about this and I've been thinking about this, like I have not yet heard about anybody invoking the Palermo Protocol in Calcutta. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely not in Shonagachi amongst the sex workers. Um, not really in the uh, anti-trafficking cell or in other police uh, uh, precincts. I, I don't recall. I, I think I would have known like if, if that was. So <clears throat> sex work, I mean, it doesn't really use sex work. So prostitution is we don't, India does not ex exactly have a law on prostitution per se. So the, as you said, the, uh, the law is the ITPA, the Moral Traffic Prevention Act. And that is where prostitution is listed. And prostitution then again is also um, conflated with trafficking. So that, that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the big problems. The other thing also to remember is the ITPA is a reincarnation of a colonial law, right? It's a colonial law, which we can talk more in details about the anxiety over white slavery and whatnot. And then mm -hmm. it kind of transit. I mean, like every, the, the entire legal system in India is a colonial inheritance, right? So the ITPA, and then in 1949, after the, uh, the UN convention on the suppression, um, they instituted in 1956 the suppression of immoral traffic in women and girls, which is known as the CETA. Then the CETA was amended in 1986, and then we have the ITPA, right? Now, <clears throat> the other law, because sex work, so let me actually say prostitution, because sex work does not really appear in the legal um, documents. So, but at the same time, though prostitution is conflated with trafficking, Prostitution is not exactly deemed illegal, right? Mm. And because of this, and this is one of the main tenets of the DMSC movement, right? Because of this kind of, what should I say, like a quasi-legal status, mm. it opens up a, a huge room in practice uh, for the exploitation of sex workers by the state and by the state I'm actually kind of referring to the police and sometimes the courts. And this is an enormous thing because on the ground, the anti-trafficking cell, which is located in uh, the police headquarters in Calcutta. So they evoke ITPA mostly. But when I'm, look, when I'm working with the local police station they evoke the Indian penal code, right? Yes. So under, so I think the anti-trafficking terrain in terms of the legal terrain is so fractured and there are just so, there's so many um, laws and acts are evoked to either make arrests or to detain. And that becomes a very uncertain terrain when you're also trying to you know, engage in, in livelihood. And I think many scholars and practitioners and activists are trying to say that you know, um, this fractured terrain is actually the reason for this level of exploitation. I mean, so you have the ITPA, which is kind of the main piece, and then you have the IPC. And then um, in... Um, and then there was a section 370, which was added, and it's the Criminal Law Amendment Act, which also can be evoked and, and is evoked. So the uncertainty of what actually is under the law because of the quasi-legal status is an enormous uh, issue in terms of the sex work movement, right? Um, and, and then you have in 2013, you had the Varma Commission report following the death of uh, Jyoti Pandey in Delhi in 2000, uh, the, incident, the horrible incident that happened in Delhi. And the Varma Commission actually had a whole chapter uh, devoted to trafficking. So this is the legal terrain. It's a very fractured legal terrain. But to your point, Bobby, I've never heard anybody evoke the protocol. 
Uh, and the protocol, uh, India signed the protocol in 2002 and it was actually ratified in, uh, uh, in yeah, and it was ratified later in uh, 2011. So India is a signatory and has ratified the protocol, but on the ground, I mean, from an ethnographic perspective, it really is not evoked as much. Um, and then again, you have another bill that was proposed in 2016, uh, which is the Trafficking in Persons and Rehabilitation Bill, and it was passed by the lower house, the Lok Sabha in uh, 2018, and then it was, um, and then it did not proceed any further. There is some talk that it might again be um, uh, evoked. And uh, so, so together, this forms not only a very fractured terrain, so that's there, but there's this constant uh, re-articulation and proposal of new bills. And it would be a mistake to think, like, why is India constantly proposing these new bills, right? What's the point here? Um, so, and when I worked with um, the Women and Child Development Ministry in Delhi, and I specifically asked them the question, right? Because um, India was degraded by the trafficking in persons report uh, in 2004 to tier two watch list. And if you get degraded to tier two watch list, you know what will happen. <laughs> so that is when they proposed amendments to the uh, ITP with no consultation from any sex work organizations on the ground. But uh, DMSC was able to mount a rather strong opposition in what they call the March to Parliament and um, they were successfully, along with other sex work organization, they were able to successfully uh, halt that amendment. But then, but when I talked to, when I have talked to the, um, you know, the state officials in Women and Child Ministry, Women and Child Development Ministry, and I have um, asked them, is that, is there a reason that anytime there is a international, attention being brought to India is this like, you know, this is the home to modern slavery kind of thing, <laughs> whether it is the USTIP or the global slavery index, is that like when there is this added impetus to show like, oh my goodness, no, we, we are doing stuff, right? I mean, I mean, and, and you can understand, and you can already expect what the response is, right? The response is no, that it has nothing to do with the international pressure. This is about our commitment to save our girls and women and all that stuff. But it's hard to think that these are just coincidences, right? So, the, so with the Global Slavery Index, we have another one. And the other important thing, aspect to this, despite a very strong sex work movement, what we also have in India, like elsewhere, actually a very strong alignment between, between neo-abolitionist NGOs and, and the state, right? I mean, so for instance, Prajwala, the latest bill, um, the anti-trafficking bill was actually uh, came through the, came up through the legal system through a public interest litigation filed by Prajwala, which is a neo-abolitionist NGO. And we have several other NGOs we, who work uh, with them. And there is, uh, I mean, if I may say that there is a capture of the state in that way. So in the recent bill, the trafficking bill, not a single sex work organization was consulted. I mean, Durbar, I know DMSC um, wanted, to, uh, wanted a seat at the table, but none of it was uh, actually, um, I mean, none of it was entertained at all. And the, so to think about the national level as just within the nation um, would be a mistake, right? Because we have this international uh, kind of uh, collaborations and all of these kind of come together and uh, you see at the end of the day, a, a very significant suppression of the sex work movement itself. Yeah, I was just going to say, this is eerily similar to the situation in the Philippines. <laughs> yes, I wouldn't be surprised. I would yeah. not be asked. Yeah. What DMSC has done is that they had set up what they call the self-regulatory board. Um, 
and the self-regulatory part, which is interesting actually, and I actually note this in my manuscript is that it actually precedes the Palermo Protocol. Uh, so it, it is actually quite interesting, right? Now here is that when I, and I worked extensively with the self-regulatory board, you know, I attended um, many, many sessions uh, to unpack like, you know, what anti-trafficking work actually looks on the ground. But it was interesting when I started working with, um, with the self-regulatory board, and I mentioned that, you know, the self-regulatory board actually precedes the Palermo Protocol to the, uh, to the women. And I mean, and this kind of says something, right? Because they were not, they're not aware of the Palermo Protocol. And, uh, but what does this disconnect kind of tell us, right? Yet they're doing very important work on the ground. So just to give you a kind of an outline of what the uh, self-regulatory board does. So it came about as a very organic way to think about anti-trafficking work that uh, DMSC could engage in, right? So for instance, it's a, Shonagashi is a very densely populated area. So if somebody is new, it is hard to miss that person because you, you would immediately know. So the word in Bengali they would often use is notun muk, which is a new face. So when, you, when there is a new face, a new person, a new woman is now here, and it kind of begins with that, right? It kind of begins with um, the, uh, the loca uh, locating a new person, a new woman in the district, and then kind of uh, bringing her to the self-regulatory board to, um, uh, to determine whether she was uh, trafficked, but I'll get into this question of trafficked in a bit, whether she was trafficked, um, whether she's a minor, and all of that, and then, and then kind of um, deciding whether she can actually uh, be permitted to work in Shunagachi, or if she's a minor, then obviously it takes a very different path. And if she's unwilling to as well. Now, when I give you this outline, uh, it seems like a pretty, um, straightforward work, but we know that it is not, right? Some of these sessions would last for days, uh, would last for days. And it would last for days in a way because, and I've written about this is like, when a person, when a woman who is new ha is, is now being presented to uh, DMSC, the board, uh, there is a way that the board is also uh, acting as though it were the state, right? And at the same time, they're also part of this larger sisterhood of shared experiences of oppression and deprivation, right? So it kind of is a very complex situation, right? So for a lot of newcomers, it is hard to navigate this. So in one way, they're thinking of this as I'm navigating uh, the state, or the police for that matter. And I'm also navigating a group of women who understand my experience of deprivation, right? So it's not a very straightforward thing. It's not like, it's, so I'm not, I'm not arguing that the board is a romantic idea. So we should, I mean, it, it is, it's actually, it, it's a very complex terrain of uh, a juridical mandate, which they don't have the mandate. It's not a state mandated but at the same time, making sure that they demonstrate their commitment to anti-trafficking, while simultaneously also kind of the feminist space of that I relate to you as a sister because I have had similar experience. So it is a very, very complex, um, complex thing to, however, the argument is that as, as women who actually inhabit that space and that place, they are very knowledgeable about uh, how trafficking works, uh, how women arrive, and what like the knowledge on the ground is actually very strong. And I would say that the state actually ignores them as very vital knowledge brokers who could have been very instrumental in developing models of trafficking 
<clears throat> not based on their criminal justice system, but based on a more human rights approach, right? So based on like, you know, many, many board sessions I've attended and I write about them, I think even, because, even given the complexity of like um, the way the board interrogates, because they basically interrogate, like, you know, how did you come here? Who did you come with and all of that? So though that replicates kind of the work of the state, but at the same time, they also take a human rights approach, right? And again, Goshamila, going back to your previous question, uh, you wouldn't, we wouldn't know this without ethnographic research, right? Because I talked in details about like what, what kinds of discussions take place on the board, right? And to give you a small example, one of the things is that the women who are new, the newcomers, change their version many, many times. <laughs> so for simple things, like, you know, how did you come to Shonagas? And they will say, uh, oh, well, I came here by bus. And then maybe 10 minutes later, they will say, oh, no, I came by train. Oh, no, I was here. <laughs> like, it gets very frustrating, trust. I mean, uh, truth be told, it does get very frustrating. And I, but it gets frustrating to the board members as well. However, <clears throat> there is also a deep recognition that, you know, like one of the um, sex workers once said this in a, in, a, in a meeting, in one of the sessions, and she said, you know, to expect like women like us who have endured so much oppression and deprivation that we will just say the truth right away. Like we know that. Like this kind of intervention is kind of, it departs from the criminal justice approach, right? I mean, so they are not after the quote unquote, the truth. Well, they're after the truth, but for them, the truth is not like a black and white, right? It's way more nuanced. And I think what stands out in the board sessions is that, that they relate to that, that there is a way, and this is where the sisterhood becomes uh, a very strong part, right? So I analyze the board, uh, board sessions on these two registers. One is the juridical register, but the other one is the kinship register. <laughs> now you would think, right? I mean, then, then you're kind of departing away from just a criminal justice approach to a very different kind of approach, which leans heavily towards um, human rights and a kind of a feminist understanding of what it means to, you know, face this level of deprivation. And given that all the women, I mean, not all, the, I mean, I would say 95% of the women in Shonagachi are rural urban migrants displaced by the depletion of agriculture. They don't own land. They're the first ones to be disenfranchised. So, you know, how can you not relate to that uh, experience. So. This was really interesting. Um, and in with um, in relation to what uh, you know, what you've been uh, hearing from sex workers in these past ten years or almost ten years, you've been working with them. What are your or their recommendations for you know anti-trafficking work moving forward? How does it need to change? Um, yeah, to, in order to better respond to, to their needs and to cause less collateral damage, uh, so to speak. Thank you, Bobby. I mean, um, I think one of the things that struck me about this research is how much of a disconnect there is between medicine and law. Like it, it is like truly astounding, right? So for instance, the National AIDS Control Organization uses uh, sex work and has been using sex work and sex workers from the very beginning because that's the global programming, HIV AIDS programming. And the legal system is so, I mean, I would say regressive. Like it kind of, there is this huge kind of disconnect. So here is something to think about, right? So peer sex workers were recruited as peer educators for HIV prevention, but they cannot be uh, recruited for anti-trafficking, like trafficking prevention, right? How, so how do we make sense of this, right? How do we make sense of this? And this is something in my manuscript I'm calling kind of the unstable, right? It's the medi medical and the legal unstable, like. So something is moving forward uh, with this. And part of the amendments to the laws did not uh, really gain traction is because 
that would then impact the HIV programming, right? So how may we understand this disconnect? So why are peer edu uh, why are sex workers also not peer educators for anti-trafficking in a way that they were peer educators for, uh, for HIV prevention? And given that the Shonagachi uh, project is such a successful project because HIV cases are like remarkably low in Shonagachi after the project took off. I have not yet met a woman who does not understand the etiology of HIV. I mean, they have may they may have parallel understandings of HIV as well, like more traditional, but that does not negate the more uh, scientific etiological understanding, right? So it shows that they have been a very important player in terms of the HIV prevention as a public health. Now, if we were to think about anti-trafficking as trafficking also as a public health question, not a public question, like a um, then why are we not also you know, using the same kind of model when there is so much work on the ground already happening to actually induct sex workers as very important um, collaborators in drafting these bills, the anti-trafficking bills, because mm -hmm. they live that life, right? I mean, they have knowledge and lived experience that none of us can possibly ever gather right we are we are still going to be kind of the outsiders or if you in my case i could be like an outsider within kind of a quasi both outside and inside but i think the sex workers are critical in kind of offering what this actually means on the ground and the nuances of like uh, trafficking on the ground uh, but none of this ever get incorporated in drafting of the bills or that and I think in some ways we are still kind of, uh, in terms of the legal terrain of trafficking, we are very, in, uh, we are very immersed in a moralistic thinking. Uh, and, and the transition to thinking of this as a question of labor and livelihood hasn't really gained traction um, in a way that one would expect in the last two decades, so that that hasn't happened. And I think part of it if that hasn't happened is also because the state's insistence on a certain model of criminal justice approach to trafficking like as victims and um, traffickers and rescue and raid. So unless we shift to a human rights, per, light rights approach, I think it's going to be very challenging. And for us to shift to the human rights approach, we obviously have to involve the human beings who are at the center of this. Mm -hmm.